My name is Edward Gerjoy, G-E-R-J-U-O-Y. And I'm presently a retired professor, professor of physics emeritus at the University of Pittsburgh. Instead of doing a history of your life, we're just going to plunge in. Uh, have you tell us about your uh, relationship with Robert Oppenheimer? Fine. I think I should begin by telling you how I came to go to Berkeley and to Oppenheimer. I had graduated from City College in 1937 and actually looked for a job. I didn't want to go back to graduate school. It was the midst of the Depression. I could not find a job. So I asked my most favorite professor at P City College, whose name was Zemansky, Mark Zemansky, I asked him where I should go to learn modern physics. And he answered without hesitation that the best school was in Berkeley at Professor, J Professor Oppenheimer. That was the first time I'd ever heard of his name. And since it was as far from home in New York as I possibly could go, there was no question. And out I went. So I got to Berkeley, and my first semester was actually a course, an introduction to quantum mechanics by Oppenheimer. That was his first course from him. And it was really a revelation. It was so different from the kind of teaching that I'd been used to getting at City College. City College had the most marvelous student body. They were just miles above that on the SATs that average 100 points above anywhere else. But the st faculty was something else again. It was really terrible. And except for Zemansky and one or two others, there really were no people there whom you could respect. But so off Oppenheimer went, and he was teaching uh, elementary quantum mechanics, which I had know nothing about, really, because it was in those days sort of hardly began. People didn't know about it. So and that's when I started, and then I took another course from him. The next semester, I took the second half of electromagnetic theory from Oppenheimer, and then I took his more advanced course in quantum mechanics, and that's, that's how we went. That's how I got into it. And as far as working with Oppenheimer was concerned, after I'd been there about a year, I approached Oppenheimer and told him I would like to work with him. And he says, well, he says, just come to my seminar. He had a weekly seminar I conducted with his students. He's come to the seminar, and, so, and we'll see what we can do. And that's how it began. So what was it like to work for Oppenheimer? Well, as I said, uh, his teaching was very fast. I've mentioned that elsewhere. He just ripped across the blackboard and just writing all the time and also smoking a cigarette at the same time. I've said, I mean, this cigarette was just, it's, the whole room was filled with Oppenheimer smoke. We didn't know at that time. That was something to avoid. <laughs> His head was, and he'd, he'd puff and write on the board and puff and write on the board, and then he'd come to the end of his, to where his cigarette, and he'd somehow manage to get it, let it one lit before he started, and off he'd go. And so his teaching was, as I say, it was very effective. There were, by the way, no tech. He did never refer to any textbooks. You just had to take the notes and really work like you could, trying to make sense out of what he had said. Uh, and his working with him was a little more complicated. Of his students, I relatively did not myself work with Oppenheimer very much. What happened was he always had a postdoc during the, what is the equivalent of a postdoc today. And people would come to the group, people would write Oppenheimer about problems, and he would sort of talk to his postdoc, and his postdoc would talk to his, one of the students about it. And so, for instance, the first problem I worked on had to do with an experiment which involved protons on fluor-19 producing long-range alphas, and had an angular distribution. And the angular distribution had some features which were very unusual, as thought people thought at that time. So this guy who did the experiment somewhere in the Middle West wrote to Oppenheimer, and Oppenheimer talked to his postdoc with them was Robert Serber, and Robert Serber said to me, would you like to work on this? So I said, sure. So, you know, so I went and worked on this problem, and I got it done. I thought I explained it. I, I did explain it. 
but the explanation was a little unusual, and so Oppenheimer looked at it, and he said it was okay, probably, but he thought I should wait. There's a meeting going to take place at the Physical Society in San Francisco, and Wigner was coming, and he was a great expert, so I should talk to Wigner about it. So I did, and Wigner said it was okay, and the thing got published, and so it went. So actually, of the three papers I published myself before I got my thesis, I did not work with Oppenheimer as such on any of them. I worked with his postdocs. Have you want some more details? Uh, sure. Tell me what no, no, go ahead. No, you, good. I mean, anything you might share with us that shed some light on what it was like from the point of view of a student? Or yeah. Well, as I say, from the point of view of a student, there were some students he worked more closely with. I was not one of them. And in fact, I was a little jealous. I thought that Oppenheimer played favorites to some extent. There were students whom he invited to his house. There were three or four or five students uh, whom he really was close to had worked with him. I was never favored with one of these invitations. And I knew a couple of the students. I knew I'd helped do problems, so I was pretty sure I was smarter than they were. <laughs> so, but I think that was a fault in Oppenheimer. He shouldn't have done it. He should really have not. But that was, he had a lot of students. I should say that he probably had of the order of 15 to 20 students any one time. It's a fantastic. And there were other people in his group. There were people who had come who had already had PhDs. This is long. I would come to sort of work there. So that it was not possible for him to personally be working really with all these, all these people at one time. So in that sense, the fact that I wasn't working with Oppenheimer and working with his postdocs was not surprising or anything to comment about. I think the part that was surprising was the fact that he somehow allowed himself to become sort of more friendly with some of the students and the others were kind of more out in the cold. And I've told elsewhere, he was not very good when it came to answering questions. You asked him questions in class. He would do his best to explain, but I've said I don't think he had his empathy for what people were thinking and how they were feeling was not very good. And so as a result, he frequently did not really understand the point of what was behind what was bothering a student. And if the student uh, persisted, he could get pretty caustic and sarcastic. And the result was that people were afraid to ask him questions after a while. That didn't help. And I can relate one incident, for example. Uh, Julian Schwinger, who was Oppenheimer's postdoc, a very, very smart guy, he got a Nobel Prize, whom I wrote a paper with. Oppenheimer, uh, let me backtrack. Oppenheimer was very good at one thing. He had an office, and in this office he had books which were not available in the regular department library. Books which, he, some of them in German, and so on which he had. And he allowed the students to come in and use those books. You didn't even have to knock on the door. And anyway, I was in the office one day, and Oppenheim was there, and Schwinger was there, and I had a question which was bothering me, and one of the problems I was working on, another problem, I published a paper later. And so I asked Schwinger if he would explain something to me. And so Julian got to the board and started writing on the board a bunch of things. And Oppenheimer sort of came, was there, and he sort of looked at Schwinger, and he made a remark to Schwinger, sort of a pitying remark about, it's too bad that Julian had to spend his time doing this. And I really, I just turned on Oppie. I really did. I said, look, I said, don't you want me to learn this and to get it straight? And he sort of apologized. He was really taken aback. <laughs> So that's what happened. And in his, in his seminar, again, he was really could be quite cruel to the people he was asking questions of. And uh, one of his postdocs, Leonard Schiff, who really became you know, a member of the National Academy and was a chairman at Stanford, he just practically drove him to tears when they were questioning him and th when th as Schiff was talking. And Later, when he went to the Institute, there are various stories about this, I've heard privately. For example, when Freeman Dyson came to the Institute to talk about the important work, which the demonstration that 
uh, Feynman's way of looking at uh, field theory and <coughs> and Schwinger's way of looking at it were actually identical, or they looked so different. Uh, it's well known. I mean, Oppenheimer just reduced Feynman to silence. He just couldn't talk. It wouldn't uh, look reduced Dyson to silence. He just wouldn't. It couldn't talk, and he just went back. And then Beta wrote a very strong letter to Oppenheimer. What are you talking about? This guy has done such important work. And then finally he came back to the institute and allowed him to tell what he was doing. So. <laughs> He just interviewed Freeman Dyson. Oh, did you? Yes, well, yes, yes. Well, did he talk about that? Uh, not that very incident. Oh, I see, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, of course, Dyson went, came to the Institute after that and stayed there for the rest of his life. Yeah. yeah. Well, what else do you want to know? Did you, did you, was, was your description of that um, incident in his room with, with uh, Schwinger the reason you didn't go to Los Alamos? No. Okay. The reason I didn't go to Los Alamos is the following. <clears throat> which I have not particularly publicized. And frankly, I'll leave it to your judgments to whether you want to, pu what you want to do this. In about the summer, my memory is not entirely, it's a little hazy on there, but I would say in about the summer of 1941, a good six months before Pearl Harbor, a group began assembling on the fourth floor of Le Cantor, which was a physics department, if, uh, building, physics building, behind a guard, and a number of Oppenheimer students were working there, and you couldn't get in. They were obviously working about on something classified. And Oppenheimer asked me if I wanted to work there. And I, who was pacifistically inclined, told him that I did not want to do weapons work. And then I was. <laughs> foolish enough without really thinking, I didn't know what was going on, to tell Oppenheimer that one thing I was worried about was building a weapon which might someday get into the control and I wouldn't have any control over what was done with it. And he just got furious with me. I obviously touched him on a raw nerve. I had no idea who was. And so, anyway, that's what happened. Then when Pearl Harbor took place, since you want to know my life story, it's just as interesting as Oppenheimer's, Pearl Harbor took place on a Sunday. I came into Le Cantor on Monday, Oppenheimer saw me, and he said, you've done enough work. He says, you're gonna get your PhD. And so, and I had a perfunctory oral. I put together my three papers. I had two published and one in press, and they were put together, called a thesis. I never wrote a thesis in the usual sense. And by, by the 1st of January or so, I essentially had my, I had my PhD, although it wasn't actually formally given till the summer, you know, till commencement, but I had my PhD. Okay. Then the next thing I knew, the chairman of department, Robert T. Verge, calls me in and says, well, you know, now that you have your PhD, you're no longer eligible for teaching assistantship. And so suddenly I was bereft of all support. And the next thing I knew, he also told me that my draft board, which had deferred me all these years, now that I had my PhD, they wanted to know what I was going to be doing or else they would put me in 1A. Well, I did not, I did, I was pacifistically inclined, as I said, but I certainly didn't want to go shooting at people or be shot at. So at this point, I went to Oppenheimer and I told Oppenheimer that, well, I was willing to do war work, although I had not wanted to do so before. And Oppenheimer told me, with your attitude, I do not want you. And so I had a fend for myself, and that's why I ended up doing Underwater Sound. And that's why I didn't go to Los Alamos. <laughs>